We'll dismiss our kids for Kids Quest this time, so kids, you're welcome to go. Will you pray with me? Father, as we open your word, we tackle a question that all of us have wrestled with, certainly in our emotions and in our minds as well. We wonder sometimes, Lord, if you're real, if we can trust you. I pray now, Lord, as we open your word, that you would give us understanding, that you would speak to our hearts and speak to our minds, that both our faith and reason would come together and you would make yourself evident. And we would know, Lord, that you're not only real, but you would strengthen our faith, the roots of our trust in you. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to begin a new series I've been looking to, forward to for some time called Answering Faith's Hard Questions. Over the next number of weeks, we're going to tackle some what I think are very tough and yet very significant questions to our Christian faith. This morning, we're going to look at, is God real? How do we know He's real? Is the Bible God's Word? What does it mean to be saved? Can we lose our salvation? Is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Is heaven real? Is hell real? Tough questions that we're going to walk through over the next number of weeks. You see, I believe that much of the reason people want to believe, as I talk with people, want to believe in God, they want to believe in the Bible, they want to have a faith... But they struggle because they believe their doubts and they doubt their beliefs. I recently read that some 55 million people are going to listen to sermons over a billion words in America alone this next week, this weekend. And yet research shows the number one complaint that they have as they walk away from hearing these messages is that they're boring or they don't relate to their lives. You see, I think many people struggle with their faith because they don't have satisfying answers to why do I believe. Many of us have been told, here's what you're to believe, but we have not been explained to why you should believe. What are the answers to those tough questions that we wrestle with? And so as a result, the roots of our faith are shallow. And if you have an uncertain faith, you're not going to have peace in your heart. And so my goal over the next number of weeks with you is to do this. I want to strengthen your faith in such a way that we ask the whys, not just the whats, but the whys. Why do I believe this? And is this credible to believe in? Or am I just simply committing intellectual suicide, shutting my brain off and just believing with a blind faith? I want to open the eyes of your faith and help you realize that our faith that makes sense Because God makes sense. The Bible says this, Always be ready to give an answer or to make a defense to everyone who asks you, to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. My goal is over the next number of weeks is that when your son or your daughter or your friend or a family member asks you, Why are you a believer? You can say, you know, I'm glad you asked that question. Let me explain to you why I am. I want you to be able to be comfortable to to be able to share there is a reasonableness to what I believe. And let me show you the reasons why that is. So the first question we're going to look at this morning, is God real? Is God real? The very roots of this question go all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve. You see, the moment Adam and Eve rebelled against God, you and I have been in rebellion against Him. And we have tried to shut God out of our life and act as though He does not exist. 
The roots of rejecting God and his existence go all the way back to Adam and Eve. But the evidence for who God is is all around us. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible tells us that people plainly know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Though every, through everything God has made, they can clearly see his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. The Bible is pretty clear that when you look out in creation, especially in this part of the world, you cannot mistake that there is a creator when we look at the beauty of creation. It more than tells us that there is a creator, but it tells us a great deal of who this creator is. We're going to look at that in, in future messages. But all we have to do is look around the world. But listen to what the Bible says that God makes very clear. God not only makes it evident on the outside that he is real, he makes it evident on the inside as well that every man, woman, and child that has ever been born has an intrinsic knowledge that God is. Why? Because God hardwired us with an awareness that God is. Two scholars were once having a debate about the existence of God on the radio. When the phone lines were finally opened, an irate woman who ca called up, and apparently she wasn't academically sophisticated, but she was thoroughly frustrated with these two scholarly men debating about the existence of God, and she said, ain't you guys got your eyes open? Look out the window. Where do you think all this came from? God hardwired us to know, to recognize that where there is creation, there is therefore a creator. And because I exist, I know that God is. Because God hardwired me to know that there is a God. I know it inside. It is what the very founders of our nation said was self-evident. Well, we're going to look at six reasons why we know that God is real, that he exists over the next several weeks. I was going to try and tackle a bunch of them today, and I thought, no. I better not do that. But I want to tackle at least two reasons that we know God is real. First of all, as a philosophical reason, simply to say this, life would not make sense without God. Or to say it another way, the only way to make sense of life is because God is. A second reason is this, a moral reason, that our universal sense of right and wrong, good and bad, come from God. So first of all, a philosophical reason. Life without God does not make sense. There are three kinds of people in the world who wrestle with the existence of God. There are the skeptics who doubt God. There are the agnostics who say, I don't know if there is a God. There's not enough information to say. And then there are the atheists who say, there is no God. All three people try to explain the existence of humanity without God. They try to make sense of life without Him. One of the greatest philosophers that ever lived, in fact, he wrote a best-selling book on philosophy. He lived more than 3,000 years ago. His name was King Solomon. He was the wisest king that ever lived. And it was during his lifetime that his thought maybe a midlife crisis that he was going through, he sat down and he penned one of the most famous philosophical books ever written, the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, Solomon had enormous intellect, extraordinary wealth, and he had the means and the time with which to explore the world, and he tried to find satisfaction under the sun without God. He tried to make sense of life without him. He explored every possible pursuit of happiness and fulfillment under the sun, and finally, he complained in the book. He said this, everything is meaningless, completely meaningless. He said that after he'd looked at everything in the world, life without God is like chasing the wind. It doesn't make any sense. It is despair in motion. He finally concludes with a warning to the generations who follow after him, to the younger he says, don't let the excitement of your youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him with your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. 
fear God and obey his commands, for this is everybody's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying life without God, even though you have all the wealth, all of the pleasure, life without God does not make sense. Do you know how many people I've heard over the course of years who have worked toward their retirement? They look forward to those golden years of <laughs> an ending vacation, retirement. And they finally cross that line and they retire. And I can tell you just about every one of them I've ever met will tell you it is not what it promised. Because sometimes we think that retirement, we think getting done with work, finally having leisure and pleasure and an ending vacation, life is going to be grand, life is going to be great, it's going to be fulfilling. It is not. Folks, Solomon is warning us, while you're young, now is the time to remember your Creator. Don't forget Him. It was the late atheist, Carl Sagan, who held a belief very similar to Solomon's. And he famously made this statement. You will remember it, many of you. The cosmos is all that there is or ever will be. He believed that we had evolved in mankind beyond the belief that the world came into being by a special creation of a personal God. He thought he could find happiness and meaning and significance in life apart from God. Well, the Bible tells us that every one of us know there's a God. We're hardwired that way. So why is it that people reject God? Why is that? Well, part of it has to do with our own sin nature because of our original parents uh, sinned against God. We rebelled against Him. And the moment we did that, we have been pushing God out of our lives ever since. But there's another reason. One author candidly writes that every atheist carries a spiritual and emotional laundry bag full of reasons not to believe in God. Tragically, he says, few of these reasons, listen carefully, few of these reasons have to do with God himself. Instead, it is based on their perception of God. Many atheists, agnostics as well as skeptics, I would say, for instance, have been spiritually abused. They have been hurt by one too many hypocritical Christians who judged them instead of loved them. And they decided if that's what God looks like, then who wants to believe in a God like that? Now listen carefully. For someone to say that God does not exist, what they're really saying is this. In my perception. In my view of everything I see, God does not exist. Because no one can say with absolute authority that God does not exist unless they are omniscient. Unless they know all things about everything, then they could say conclusively and authoritatively whether God did or didn't exist. Now, Carl Sagan said the cosmos is all there is and all there ever will be. But yet he lacked the intelligence, the omniscience to be able to reach out and do everything and say, I know for a conclusive fact, I've looked at everything, I know everything, that God does not exist. What he was really doing by making this statement was an, an enormous overreach of his own intellect. What Carl Sagan was really saying, and it had been far better for him to say, would be this. It is my perception that the cosmos is all that there is, and this is all there is. No one could say that God does not exist unless they have complete knowledge about everything. You ever wondered why it is so many people believe in God and there are so few atheists if God does not exist? And all the way through history, we find that men and women and children have believed in God. Why? Because we know intuitively there is a God. So at best, all Carl Sagan could say is, it is my perception that the cosmos is all that there is. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of the 19th century, said it this way. He said, there are no atheists anywhere but on earth. 
There are no skeptics or agnostics anywhere but on earth either. There are none in heaven, and there are none in hell. Atheism, he says, is a strange thing. Even the devils, the demons, never fall into that vice. The demons believe and tremble, James tells us. You see, atheism is really an attempt. Listen carefully. Atheism is really an attempt to replace man with God. It's an attempt to put man at the center of the universe instead of God. One author says it well. He says, that in a way is the ultimate irony. Atheists, in their denial of God, cannot help but replace the truly omniscient God with a cheap imitation themselves. To say that God does not exist demands a degree of intellect at a level of omniscience that we do not have. At best, we could say, it is my perception that God does not exist. And much of the reason people say that God does not exist has less to do with God himself, but has more to do with their experience of those who say they believe in God. Ironic, isn't it? The truth is, life on this earth never satisfies Every one of us have a deep hunger in our hearts for something more, and that something more is someone more. All of us have a God-shaped void in our hearts that only God can satisfy. When was the last time, for instance, that you heard of someone on their deathbed who wanted an atheist to come and comfort and bring solace to their soul for the afterlife? I've never heard it happen. Why? Because they have no answers. That's why. You see, you'll never have peace in your heart until you have peace with God. The Bible says this, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Listen, the only way you'll ever have peace, the satisfaction, the sense of meaning that this life promises is when you know the someone who makes all the difference in your life that brings the fulfillment, and that is God himself. And the only way you can know him is through his son, Jesus Christ. The moment you cross that line of faith and you say, Lord Jesus, you make sense. It's the only answer I know. And you trust him as your Savior and your Lord. For the first time, you begin to experience an inside of your heart a fulfillment and a satisfaction and a peace like you've never known before. Why is that? Because there's a God-shaped void in every one of us and we'll never find meaning, we'll never find significance or satisfaction in this life until we come to know that someone who will make all the difference, and that is God himself. You see, I believe much of the source of our inner anxiety, our lack of peace, our restlessness, our irritability with life, if you will, is because we are alienated from our maker. We're alienated from God himself. And apart from God, life is meaningless. It will never make sense. Atheism says that this is all there is. There is nothing more. You live, you die, and that's it. But you see, the problem with atheism is this, that it cannot adequately answer this question. Solomon, in his book, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, says that God has placed eternity in every one of us, though we do not understand it. Meaning this, that every human soul that has ever lived has a recognition, an awareness that there is something beyond the grave. There is such a thing as called eternal life. And more than that, we long for it because we know we're made for it. And atheists cannot explain that. Agnostics cannot explain that. Skeptics cannot explain that. Yet the Bible alone says God alone does explain it. You'll never find peace in your heart. You'll never find peace in your life until you step into that relationship with Jesus Christ. It was a 17th century French mathematician, physicist, philosopher, and follower of Christ, Blaise Pascal, who said that we must choose between despair and God. Otherwise, life would be meaningless, he says. And he developed what was known as Pascal's wager, 
listen, here's how, here's how it goes. Pascal said this, if you, if you bet on God, you wager on God, and you lose, you lose nothing. But if you win, you win everything. You win heaven. You win eternal life. You win peace. You win forgiveness. You win acceptance. You win meaning and satisfaction in life. But if you wager against God, you lose everything. So you must choose between despair and God. You choose where you want to be. The Bible says that when we seek God with all our hearts, we will find him. And I want to challenge you where you're at right now. Maybe you think that God is not real. I challenge you to say, God, I'm going to seek you. Not just with my mind, but with my heart. Would you make yourself real to me? And God promises this in his word. Jeremiah 29, 13. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Let me give you another reason that God exists, a moral reason. And that is our universal sense of right and wrong came from God. That God has hardwired us, all of us, with a sense of right and wrong. Something, again, our founding fathers said was self-evident as they looked at man, they looked at the world. You see, universal morality says this. If there is a universal moral law, then there must be a universal moral law giver. Where did this universal worldwide, timeless sense of right and wrong come from. It came from a law giver, a great moral giver. It's not simply true of the U.S., it's true of every country in the world. It is true universally. So moral law is like mathematics. It is true whether you understand it or not. It is true whether, who, no matter who you are or where you live. An evolutionist cannot explain how morality came into being at a universal level as it has. You see, the major religions of the world, which represent the vast majority of the people, disagree a great deal about God. But the funny thing is, they all agree about morality, basic morality. All the religions of the world have some form of the golden rule. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Listen to what the Bible says. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, that is the moral law of God, do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written, where? On their hearts. How? Their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. How do we know the moral law is universal and written on every man, woman, and child's heart? Because we have the law written in our hearts, and our conscience bears witness to that, either accusing or defending us. We know. We see the law at work not only in the U.S., but we see the law at work in every country around the world. It was that moral law at work that allowed the U.S. to say to Nazi Germany, this is wrong. It was the moral law in the human heart that caused the world to stand up and form what is known as the UN today. One of the greatest thinkers and defenders of the Christian faith was a man by the name of C.S. Lewis. He was a prolific author and thinker, and he penned a book called The Abolition of Man. And he illustrated the moral law that we see at work in the universe this way. He said, just imagine, if you will, that you were going to go on a trip and you were going to visit 10 different islands in the ocean. When you went to the very first island, you found that they all abided by an unspoken list of do's and don'ts of morality. That the government authorities had not even codified or put in written form what these laws of morality are. But everybody knew, because it was unspoken, but they agreed that you should not kill, you should not steal, you should not commit adultery. They knew these things. Then you went on to the next island. 
And something amazing happened when you went to the next island. This island had never communicated with that other island, nor had the other island communicated with them. And yet, amazingly, remarkably, they had virtually the same moral code. Then you went to the third island. And you found remarkably the same moral code intact and at work. And then you went to the fourth, and so on and so on. And by the time you visited all ten islands, you recognized that there was a universal sense of law, that all of them understood and abided by an ultimate moral code. Why? Because there is an ultimate moral code giver. Does that sound too far-fetched, almost too theoretical? C.S. Lewis and many other sociologists have discovered that to be true in every culture that has ever existed in the 6,000 years of recorded history of mankind. They all share a common thread of moral agreement of a basic right and wrong. Interesting, they also esteem virtues that we esteem as well, love and kindness and honesty and selflessness. Where did that come from? It came from God. That's where it came from. It doesn't mean that everyone does what is right or wrong, but it does mean that everyone knows what is right and wrong. I've been a parent. I know that's true. But you see, Lewis was far from alone. Many others have studied these throughout time, and it doesn't matter whether it's the Phoenicians or the Greeks or the Romans or the Egyptians or 21st century U.S., Every one of us recognize there is an intrinsic moral code that we recognize what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. Where'd that come from? It came from God. We all have a moral sense of obligation to our Creator. Speaking about parents, how do you know when your children are up to no good? When it gets too quiet, that's how you know. And why is that? Because they don't want you to know. Why is it that when a person does something wrong, they don't want other people to know? Because written in this moral code inside of our heart being made in the image of God is also an awareness that when we violate that moral code, we are offending our Maker. We intuitively recognize that when I mess up, when I do what is wrong, I'm going to be held accountable by God. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 1, or John says in John chapter 1, men loved darkness and hated the light. Because we ultimately have a heart that wants to reject God and push Him out of our lives to do what we want to do. But the moment we do it, we know we've done something wrong. We begin to realize, hey, I'm violating God. I'm going against God. What's interesting about this moral law is it doesn't apply to the rest of creation, but it applies to you and me who are made in the image of God. For instance, when was the last time that you saw a coyote that was incarcerated for killing a rabbit on death row? Or when was the last time you saw snow being fined for crushing a roof? You'll never see it happen. Why? Because this moral law applies to people who are made in the image of God, moral beings. Now, why is that so important for us? It doesn't just simply point to God. This moral code inside of us also reveals an awareness of a need for forgiveness and a Savior. That the only way I can find comfort and relief and peace and forgiveness from my conscience either accusing me or defending me, is from the moral lawgiver, God himself. And the Bible says that God understood that. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, He, God, is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son and forgave us our sins. God didn't simply leave you to, to boil in your sense of of wrong, your guilt, he provided a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you cross that line of faith and you trust him, then you find that forgiveness 
or you have violated that moral code against the ultimate moral law giver. Pascal said this, you must choose between God or despair. And if you wager with God and you lose, you lose nothing. But if you wager against God and you lose, you lose everything. But if you wager with God and you win, you win everything. So you must choose God or despair. Which will you choose? You see, I believe that God is going to put people in your lives over this next week and days to come. And that he has already orchestrated divine appointments in which someone's going to come to you. You're going to see an opportunity, and they're going to say, why are you a believer? How do you know that God is? The Bible says, always be ready to make a defense, to give an account for why you believe. Are you ready? Maybe you're struggling in your faith and you're wondering, is this really real? How can I know this is real? I want to invite you to be a part of every one of these messages in the weeks to come. I don't want to go so deep that I lose everybody, but I want to stay at a place where I give you enough that you'll know that your, the roots of your faith are so strong that when someone asks you, how do you know? You can say, I'm glad you asked. Here's how I know. Now, ultimately, you must choose. Despair or God, because life would not make sense without him. In a moment, Ken is going to lead us in communion this morning. But will you pray with me as we bring this to a close? With your heads bowed where you're sitting right now, I don't believe it is an accident that you're here this morning. That when you got up this morning, it was by sovereign, divine appointment that God would have you here. And God has been speaking to your heart. And he's asking you, which will you choose? Will you choose me? Meaning, significance, life. Or will you choose despair? Will you choose to believe or will you choose to reject? The choice is yours. And I believe that God is speaking to your heart right now. And he's asking you to believe, to cross that line of faith. You know he is real. He has made himself real countless times in your life. Would you turn to him right now and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're real. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were buried and on the third day you rose again from the grave, triumphant over sin and death. That you are the forgiver that I need. You are the savior that I need for the things I've done wrong. Lord, my conscience reminds me too often of my guilt and my shame. But I'm asking, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me? Would you come into my life? Would you help me to step over that line of faith and step into a life of meaning and significance and fulfillment that can be found in you alone? Thank you, Lord Jesus. I give you my life in faith and ask, Lord, in faith that you'd help me to live now for you. In your name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Ken?